So when we hear about these different groups, when we hear that there were divisions in the church of Corinth, the question is, what does this mean uh, for the different denominations? Are they useful? Are they useless? Well, it's a complicated issue. I'm going to give you a little bit of history, and I'm going to give you my own personal viewpoint. In the 1200s, uh, Rome and the Eastern Orthodox Church, they split. Uh, they didn't speak the same language, Greek versus Latin, and they argued about the Trinity. And it's sad, but they were kind of heading that way for a while, and eventually separated. As you all know, in the 1500s, there was the Protestant Reformation. Uh, you had diverse, various Protestant groups that they split from Rome because Rome had forgotten some important things in the Bible. They put their traditions above the truth of Scripture. And they regained important bits of doctrine, like the importance of faith and grace, how you can be justified. This is, this is very useful. However, since then, there have been numerous smaller groups, and smaller splits, and it, it's really a sad picture of human rigidness and pettiness, how people would prefer division and schism versus the mending power, the unifying power of the cross. And so I'd say rather than create some new denominations, let us focus on renewing the ones that we have, and let there be a fresh touch of God in the existing ones. Because the way of unity is through the cross. We continue. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The Living Bible says, did Paul die for your sins? Good News Bible puts it, Christ has been divided into groups. Now the answer to these three questions is of course no. Christ is not divided. Paul was not crucified for you and you weren't baptized in Paul's name. But it's a sad picture to see the body of Christ broken into pieces. I want to say thanks be to God for mission set which unites us as Christians. It unites us under the cross of Christ. And I want to say thanks be to God for the Bible societies of the world, for the Canadian Bible Society, for the American Bible Society, for the London Bible Society, and others. Because they unite people under the word of God. Recently I've been reading a book uh, about a missionary to India. Silas Fox, the white fox of there. <coughs> He went to India just at the start of World War I, and he stayed there all the way up into the 50s and 60s. And one thing that he did was he chose that rather than um, dressing, you know, like a foreigner and like a missionary, like someone who was different, he chose to dress like the Indian people. And the missionary board was not happy with they were not happy. They were like, what are you doing? It's shameful. You've got to look different because you're a foreigner and you're better. And... Well, maybe they didn't say that, but they were all thinking that. <laughs> and so he said, no, no, I'm going to dress like regular people. And this worked out well for him, except one day he found that his sandals had really worn into his feet. So much so that he couldn't walk around. And so he decided that um, dressing like local people is good, but you still need to be wise about it. So he put his shoes back on, and then he could still look you know, like regular people, but he could also go around to preach the gospel. And another thing that he did is he took a bold step and he actually left the denominational mission society so that he could preach to all of the different Christian churches in the area. And this meant that he was leaving behind his um, support network. And he had to actually trust God and call out to individual people. So he went out to independently preach to any and to all the message of Christ in India. And God used him mightily 
Because like Paul, he understood it wasn't about appearances and prestige and ritual, but it was about preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Now Corinth, they loved their prestige. They loved their appearance. They loved their ritual. Mm. Just couldn't get enough of it. And you see, Corinth, it was a relatively new church. And it was full of baby Christians. And as my nephew Aaron can attest, babies howl and complain sometimes. <laughs> Here they howled to Paul about each other. And they howled to each other about Paul. And Paul would not take the bait. In the different factions listed, there's an implied opposition to Paul in Corinth. Even though Paul had gone to the hard work of setting up the church, these people thought, I knew better. Paul, though, he chose to forgive those who maligned his leadership. As it says in Colossians, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now he knew that you don't want to hold a grudge or to nurse one. Nurse babies, not grudges. <laughs> because grudges, if you continue to nurse them, if you continue to hold them, they become the children of bitterness. And bitterness, it will run around and it will cause trouble, it will break things, throw temper tantrums. Yeah, that's not good. But if you continue along with bitterness, bitterness turns to revenge. And revenge, it holds you. It clings onto your back like a monkey. And you can't shake it off. Unless you fall down at the foot of the cross and ask Jesus to take away his desire from you, it, it's got you it's just hanging on. And if you don't deal with revenge, revenge turns to hatred which controls you. Hatred will turn your head away from people. And it literally wants the other person to die. So we need to keep short accounts with one another to avoid grudges and quarreling. I remember um, when I was in uh, Campus Crusade for Christ up at SFU, I had a friend of mine who we were leading the uh, local We were leading the local uh, group where we'd meet every, we were setting that up. But we ended up uh, arguing with each other, quarreling, there were a lot of angry feelings on both sides. So eventually, what we had to do was we had to get uh, a mediator, we had to uh, fall down uh, at the foot of the cross and confess our sins. And thankfully, because of this, I still have that friend and we've got a much better relationship because of it. But we need to keep those short accounts with each other. We can't hold on to this bitterness, to this unity, to this schism that will rip us apart. We need to look to the cross of Christ. As it continues, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Christmas and Dice, lest any of you should say that I have been baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. The message puts it well here. God didn't send me out to collect a following for myself, but to preach the message of what he has done and to collect a following for him. Baptism was in to the name of Christ. But the different groups, they were playing the game of who baptized whom. Well, I was baptized by Paul. Ooh, by Paul. Well, I was baptized by Apollos. Ooh, ooh, Apollos. Oh, yeah? I was baptized by Peter in Jerusalem. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Wow. <laughs> but the problem is they were using this as a method of prestige and a method of making themselves look good, a message of 
See, baptism, it's not going to save you. It doesn't affect salvation. But preaching the cross of Christ does. Now, Paul here is not speaking bad of baptism, but he's saying that exalting a person who baptized you is ridiculous. It's totally missing the point. In baptism, it's a sign. It's a wonderful sign. It's a sign to the community, it's a sign to the church, it's a sign to people around you of what God is doing in your life. But sadly, many denominations are still divided over baptism. And I'm sure you know, um, there's even been death for this issue. So Lord have mercy. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made an effect. This is the simple truth of God. Paul's goal was to tell the good news in simple, easy language, to avoid playing the game of the Greek philosophers, with the flowery words and the secret wisdom. Hey, let me tell you a secret. It's wonderful. Now, he doesn't mean that at all. Because when you play that game, when you start to make the Word of God a secret, or you need to dress it up, you're emptying it of its power. Verse 18 says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Verse 18 explains that the cross, humanly speaking, it's not wise. It was defeat. And the notion of the resurrection is foolishness. As the message says, sheer silliness. But to us who know Jesus, it is the power of God. The word for power is dunamos, from which we get the word dynamite. This is no weak defeat, but the power of God over sin and death and the world. This power allows us to say no to ungodliness and to schism. So, what unites the church? Is it powerful leaders? No. Is it rituals and baptism? Sadly, no. Is it the cross of Christ? Yes. Lift high the cross and use it to bridge the denominational boundaries. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your church. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us into the world to follow your cross, to be under you, God. Dear God, uh, it's hard at times. Sometimes, Lord, we want to fight with those brothers and sisters around us. Oftentimes, we find them irritating. We need to uh, come to you, God and put these divisions at the foot of the cross. Help us, Lord, to be able to come together and to seek the unity that you have asked of us. May God, we truly realize that apart from you, we can do nothing, but that at the cross, at the foot of the cross, we are all equal, and we can lay down our burdens and lay down our Thank you, Lord. Jesus.